Support for this and all the free content of Addressing Gettysburg is made possible by our patrons over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. All right, everybody. It's uh, 1.30. You guys all must really like the Civil War to be out in public at a time like this. Um, I guess I'm not competing with anything else, though. You can't watch basketball. You can't watch hockey. You can't even watch spring training. So I, I guess I'm the only entertainment available. Uh, I'm glad you're here. I'd like to welcome all of you to uh, Gettysburg National Military Park, to our, our winter lecture series. Um, I should also say, if you are operating from an older printed schedule, uh, rather than the revised schedule published and printed and put online a few weeks ago, uh, you may be surprised to see that I am not, in fact, Ranger Matt Atkinson. Uh, if you were here expecting to see Matt Atkinson, I'm very sorry to report that I'm not as funny as he is. Um, Matt spoke last weekend. Uh, his talk had to be rescheduled, so I changed uh, times with him. Uh, but uh, I am uh, Zach Siggins. I've been a seasonal park ranger here for several years now, and uh, I'm grateful to be here to speak about the Union uh, 11th Corps, and uh, a sharp-eyed observer uh, today may notice a slight difference between my title, as it's printed on my PowerPoint screen, uh, and the title uh, printed on the schedule, uh, and that is that my title, importantly, includes a question mark. Uh, with the oft-used pejorative for the 11th Corps. I don't know whether the absence of the question mark uh, reflects Chris Gwynn's opinion of the 11th Corps or not. Uh, I doubt it does, but uh, my title includes the question mark. And, uh, and that really captures what I hope to do today as we look at the Union 11th Corps together. I want to ask and assess whether the criticism of the 11th Corps here is fair and valid. Uh, many of you are, are likely familiar with a common narrative about the soldiers and officers of the 11th Corps that suggests they turned and ran here at the Battle of Gettysburg. You've heard of the Flying Dutchman, of Howard's cowards, uh, that they quickly and familiarly collapsed under the Confederate onslaught north of town, providing little to no resistance and offering no significant contribution to the Union Army of the Potomac here at Gettysburg. And I think that narrative is both unfortunate uh, and inaccurate. Uh, to be sure, there are problems with the 11th Corps. There are errors made here at Gettysburg, uh, but the evidence does not suggest that this was a corps full of cowards who turned and ran at the first sign of trouble. So what I plan to do is, is to look at, at the common narrative about the 11th Corps first, uh, to examine where it comes from, why they got the poor reputation that you are likely familiar with. And then I want to challenge the narrative about the 11th Corps by looking in, in greater detail at their actions and the actions of their leadership uh, here on July 1st. And then finally, I hope to change the narrative uh, a bit, drawing some conclusions about how we should view them uh, and their fighting here on July 1st. Uh, but I'll begin uh, with a caveat, though. Uh, a topic this broad uh, cannot be dealt with in great detail uh, in the time we have today. While I plan to look at their experience and, and their fighting in greater detail, hopefully, than we often hear the 11th Corps talked about. Uh, it would be impossible to really zoom in too specifically uh, to the actions of units at the, the regimental and even really at the, the brigade level here. We, we could always dig deeper and get more specifically in our study and analysis and talks about this battle. Uh, but most of the time, I want to speak about the Corps as a whole and focus uh, on its three divisions. Uh, zooming in only when necessary you know, to provide a few specific examples uh, to illustrate uh, the larger point of the, the program. Uh, so with that being said, let's begin by, by looking a bit about the common narrative about the 11th Corps and some of their background before uh, the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, before it was added to the Union Army 
of the Potomac. The 11th Corps uh, fought as a first corps of the Army of Virginia under John Pope. And I think that helps at least in part to contribute uh, to this common narrative uh, that emerges about them. Because they were added to the Army of the Potomac uh, from the outside, they were viewed by many in the Army of the Potomac as outsiders. They're the new guys. They were technically playing on the same team, uh, but there was little goodwill between the Army of uh, Virginia and the Army of the Potomac in the early fall of 1862 after Union defeats on uh, the peninsula uh, and at the Second Battle of Bull Run when the Army of uh, Virginia was added to uh, the, the Army of the Potomac after those two defeats. Uh, there were accusations uh, that the Army of the Potomac was uh, slow to react to requests for help from the Army of Virginia during Second Bull Run. And the Army of the Potomac uh, was suspicious of units that they viewed as less experienced than those who fought alongside of them during the Peninsula uh, Campaign. So that's, that's part of the, the problem for these soldiers from the 11th Corps. They're outsiders um, to the Army of the Potomac when they're at it. Uh, but the belief that the soldiers of the new 11th Corps were less experienced uh, appears to be more due to the prejudice of those in the Army of the Potomac than the facts about the officers and men of the 11th Corps. Uh, the Corps commander at the time, uh, General Franz Siegel, uh, he had military academy training in Germany, had commanded troops during uh, some of the German revolutions of 1848. He experienced a higher level of command than many of his counterparts. Uh, in uh, the Union Army had prior to the Civil War, and uh, in fact many officers had also fought uh, to some degree or another in uh, the European revolutions uh, in 1848. So some of the officers uh, with experience fighting in Europe in 1848 who commanded troops in the 11th Corps here at Gettysburg, uh, in, they include uh, Karl Schurz, uh, Leopold von Gilsa, Alexander Schimmelfennig, and George von Antwerp. So combined with their Civil War experience, and uh, Siegel had commanded uh, pretty successfully in the, the West uh, in the earliest part of the war, the officers and men of the 11th Corps had combat experience by the time they were added to the Army of the Potomac. And new units were added in November of 1862 to, to bolster uh, the numbers of the Corps, bringing that level of experience down, but that was not uncommon. Uh, so they're not uh, a completely inexperienced uh, core when they are added uh, to the Army of the Potomac. Uh, and like I said, I think that their lack of acceptance by the Army of the Potomac, it had more to do with prejudice than fact. The 11th Corps had the reputation of being the German Corps, hence the, the nickname the Flying Dutchman. Uh, but that's also not really an accurate uh, reflection of the Corps. So prior to the addition of the, the new regiments, the historian of the 11th Corps, uh, James S. Pula, who wrote uh, a very good two-volume history of the 11th Corps uh, under the crescent moon uh, with uh, the reference to their Corps badge, uh, he notes that only about 60% of the Corps were of German ancestry. And this was only further diminished when new regiments uh, were added in uh, to the Corps, with uh, only four of the 11 new regiments added being from a largely German background. But that reputation kind of stuck. They were the German Corps, and it was yet another factor uh, in the 11th Corps being viewed by the Army of the Potomac as outsiders. Um, one thing to note that the, about that, because of the large number, uh, larger numbers of ethnic Germans, many of whom uh, had uh, some uh, experience uh, immigrating after the European uh, revolutions of 1848, the, the core also tended to be filled with Republicans who were strongly anti-slavery. Carl Schurz, for example, was a candidate for lieutenant governor uh, in Wisconsin, and he chaired the Wisconsin delegation to the 1860 Republican uh, Convention. So you know at the time uh, that they are added in, George McClellan, who's commanding the army, he ran, uh, he would eventually run against Lincoln uh, as a Democrat in 1864, and many uh, like him in the Army of the Potomac. They were war Democrats, uh, they were supportive of the Union at the time, uh, but deeply suspicious of turning the war into an anti-slavery fight. And so I think that also contributes to some of the, 
the, uh, the reluctance to embrace some of the, the 11th Corps. But all of these factors, the fact that they're added from the Army of, the Virginia, of Virginia, uh, the fact that they're made up of larger uh, numbers of ethnic Germans, and that they had some high-level figures who were strongly anti-slavery with ties to the Republican Party, it likely, uh, they likely all contributed to the perception that this Corps, that they were made up of outsiders. Uh, by the time of the Battle of Gettysburg, though, in command of the 11th Corps was uh, General Oliver Otis Howard, who's an outsider to the Corps. Um, it's worth reflecting on him uh, before we, we move forward. Uh, he was appointed after Siegel resigned due to conflict uh, with uh, Army of the Potomac Commander Joe Hooker. Um, Howard, he replaced Siegel, who was extremely popular, uh, especially amongst uh, the German soldiers. and. Uh, we should note about Oliver Howard that he was appointed from outside the Corps. Uh, he bypassed Carl Schurz, who was the most senior division commander and who a lot of the soldiers uh, and officers expected would be made Corps commander. Uh, some in the Corps, it's worth noting, were glad uh, that Howard had been appointed. Theodore Dodge commented, I'm glad for once that the Corps is turned over to an American commander. Uh, but despite that, sentiment from, from Dodge, by and large, uh, things were rocky uh, for Oliver Howard in his relationship with the 11th Corps from the beginning. Uh, Frederick Otto von Fritsch, remembered of the news of Howard's appointment, uh, he said, toward the night the whole camp knew of the change in command, and after the first surprise, the feeling was bad enough. All the men had some affection for Siegel and had heard of the great show of piety of his successor which had prejudiced them against him. Writing about that night, I heard various exclamations, boys, let us pray. And then tracks now, instead of sauerkraut. So uh, Oliver Howard, uh, his reputation for being deeply religious and publicly displaying it really uh, made him uh, not very popular with the men from the beginning. His status as an outsider meant that the Corps never really truly accepted him the way that they had Siegel. The quartermaster of the 11th Corps commented at one point, the officers and soldiers of the 11th Corps did not approve of what seemed the attempt of General Howard to make a Sunday school class of a military organization. And uh, along with Howard came uh, the boy General uh, Francis C. Barlow, who had served under a regimental commander, uh, as a regimental commander under Howard prior to Howard being wounded during the Peninsula Campaign. And that decision would also, as we'll see, uh, have uh, significant consequences here at Gettysburg. So Howard uh, is an outsider. He brings in some outsiders, and uh, the reality of the relationship between Howard and the 11th Corps uh, is that, as one of my colleagues put it, the 11th Corps doesn't like Howard, and Howard doesn't like the 11th Corps, and there's, there's not much goodwill from the very beginning. Fast forward to the, the Battle of Chancellorsville. Howard's rocky beginnings uh, with them continued onto the battlefield uh, with Stonewall Jackson's attack on the right flank of the Union Army there. Uh, it's an indisputable disaster for the 11th Corps that confirmed in the minds of many in the Army uh, that the, the Corps could not be trusted, that they were full of soldiers who turned and ran at the first sign of trouble. Uh, but we should say much of the fault for the disaster at Chancellorsville really lays squarely on the shoulders of Oliver Howard. Uh, even though the attack uh, that would crush the 11th Corps line, even though that attack did not take place until the early evening, uh, intelligence was passed to Howard early in the morning about Confederate movements on his front. At 9.30 a.m., this order was sent to Howard from Army he Headquarters. I am directed by the Major General Commanding to say that the disposition you have made of your Corps has been with a view to a front attack by the enemy. If he should throw himself upon your flank, he wishes you to examine the ground and determine upon the positions you will take in that event in order that you may be prepared for him in whatever direction he advances. He suggests you have heavy reserves well in hand to meet this contingency. The right of your line does not appear to be strong enough. No artificial defenses worth naming have been thrown up and there appears to be a scarcity of troops at that point, 
and not in the, agener- in the general's opinion as favorably posted as might be. We have good reason to suppose that the enemy is moving to our right. Howard did little to prepare and repeatedly ignored uh, the warnings about uh, rebel movements from across the army and within his own corps. Uh, uh, he was convinced that Lee was in retreat. At one point, an alarmed Carl Schurz asked Howard if he could face his entire division uh, in the direction from which the a- attack eventually came, and Howard said no. He dismissed his advice and his request. And, and when the attack came, the 11th Corps simply collapsed under the pressure of superior numbers uh, attacking an exposed, unsupported flank. Or, as many in the Army of the Potomac believed, the German Corps turned and ran. And Howard himself perpetuated that myth. He said in an interview after the war, the Germans ran. But Abner Doubleday, who, uh, with the death of John Reynolds, uh, rose to command uh, the 1st Corps alongside the 11th Corps here at On July 1st, he's helpful in his analysis of what happened at Chancellorsville. He really doesn't have a dog in the fight. And he said uh, this with the benefit of hindsight. He said, it's always convenient to have a scapegoat in case of disaster. And the German element in the 11th Corps has been fiercely censured, and their name become a byword for giving way on this occasion. The Germans were bitterly denounced for this catastrophe, I think very unjustly, for in the first place, less than one half of the 11th Corps were Germans, And in the second place, the troops that did form line and temporarily stop Jackson's advance were Germans. So what we see at Chancellorsville is that the prejudice of those in the Army of the Potomac, uh, including the prejudice of their own officers in some instances, really turned against the 11th Corps uh, to avoid accepting responsibility for defeat. Again, the historian of the 11th Corps, James S. Pula, he argues that the defeat of the 11th Corps, as bad as it was, was not reason for the ultimate Union defeat at the Battle of, uh, Battle of Chancellorsville. Uh, but even if one wanted to place the blame for defeat at Chancellorsville at the feet of the 11th Corps, the blame shouldn't rest at the feet of the men uh, of the Corps. It should rest uh, on the shoulders of their leadership. Uh, Pula is helpful when he concludes the conclusion can only be that the 11th Corps was struck by a greatly superior force in a position impossible to defend. And that narrative, uh, that accurate narrative, I think it's also true of the Battle of Gettysburg. So that's the path forward I want to take as we move into looking at this battle. Uh, you know, Why spend so much time on the background and on uh, the Battle of Chancellorsville? I think we need to do that because the 11th Corps When they go into battle here, they had to deal with that unfair reputation marching with them. They had to deal with newspapers writing these things about them, uh, things like uh, this about their previous engagement. To the disgrace of the 11th Corps, be it said, the division of General Schurz, which was first assailed, almost instantly gave way. Threats, entreaties, and orders of commanders were of no avail, avail. Thousands of these cowards threw down their guns and soon streamed down the road towards headquarters. That's the reputation they're carrying into battle here. That's what they know their comrades and the country believes to be true about them. Morale in the 11th Corps is low. It's bad. Uh, But as we move to challenge uh, the narrative about them here, I think it's important to see uh, that from the beginning, We have to start uh, by digging a little deeper to say that that view of the 11th Corps is woefully inadequate to explain them. And that uh, that will affect uh, how people interpret what happened here uh, at Gettysburg. Uh, So as we shift to thinking about the battle here, I think one important thing to remember about the 11th Corps uh, as a whole is that after the death of of John Reynolds, uh, fairly early in the morning. Oliver Howard is the senior commander on the field. Uh, He's not technically in command of the 11th Corps for much of July 1st, but he's really commanding both the 1st and 11th Corps, turning over uh, command of the 11th Corps uh, to Carl Schurz. And uh, there are a few things we can say about Howard. Even before he took overall command of the field, Howard is well aware, along with many others in the Union Army, of the strategic importance 
of Cemetery Hill. He ordered Adolf von Steinware to occupy the hill uh, as his reserve. So you have Oliver Howard to thank for uh, the naming of Steinware Avenue here in town. And uh, whatever else may be said about Howard and his leadership and his decision making on that day, and there are certainly elements uh, to criticize, but um, it's worth highlighting that you know he did recognize the importance along, uh, of Cemetery Hill along with with many others, and yes, it was the intention of John Reynolds to hold that ground, it was the, the intention of the Union Army to hold that ground, but Oliver Howard was the one who was left to carry out those intentions, even if there wasn't much of an uh, alternative by the time that Howard takes command. Uh, it's also worth noting that Howard responds pretty decisively uh, to some events here. He repeatedly uh, requested that Henry Slocum advance the 12th Corps to Gettysburg to support the 1st and 11th Corps uh, in their fight. He also uh, very early on uh, urged General Sickles uh, to quickly come up as quickly as he could uh, to Gettysburg. Um, while Sickles responded, uh, Howard's appeals were ignored uh, by Henry Slocum, who uh, as the, the wing commander of the, that wing of the Union Army, he was really waiting uh, for orders from uh, General Meade uh, about what he was supposed to do. Slocum, of course, does not report to Howard. He's receiving these uh, requests and is not quite sure what to make of them. And some historians will try to paint Henry Slocum as entirely re reluctant to advance, even going so far as essentially saying Slocum doesn't want to advance because he doesn't want to have to accept responsibility for being in command on the field and uh, if things go wrong, if, if General Meade's intentions aren't to, to fight here, he doesn't want to be uh, responsible for it, so he thinks he can just avoid responsibility by staying far away. I, I don't think that's entirely fair. Howard himself notes with a degree of understanding that Slocum was under the impression that General Meade did not want to fight here at Gettysburg at that point in time. Uh, and it's also it's you know quite reasonable that Slocum does not want to take aggressive action at the urging of a more junior officer without knowing clearly what General Meade's intentions are. So some people will try to uh, paint Henry Slocum into a bit of a villain, especially if they you know want to try to defend uh, Oliver Howard. Um, I, I'm not sure that's fair, but Howard does repeatedly ask for help and, and tries to communicate. That. So all of us reminds us uh, of a few points to remember about the fighting on 11th, uh, of the 11th Corps here on July 1st. And, and the first is simply that it's never intended for the 11th Corps to indefinitely hold their position north of town. As uh, our division chief, Chris Gwynn, put it to me in conversation when I first brought up the subject uh, for this program, uh, he put it very helpfully. He said, you know, the question of uh, of whether or not you know the 11th Corps is going to withdraw. That's not really the question on July 1st. The question is when and in what manner will they withdraw. And I think that's a, a good point to remember. And then second, we have to remember that the 11th Corps and the entire Union Army uh, is badly outnumbered on July 1st. Uh, the Union Army had not yet concentrated to the same degree uh, that the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia had. And there wasn't even really a clear impression across the army about whether or not they were supposed to be concentrating here at Gettysburg. And then it, it, finally it's worth keeping in mind that uh, the temporary promotion of Howard to, to command meant that Carl Schurz is acting as Corps commander for the very first time. Alexander Schimmelfenig uh, is in command of a division for the first time and George von Amsberg was in command of, of the brigade for the first time on July 1st. And while that's that's true in similar situations across this battlefield. It's especially true uh, of the First Corps fighting alongside them. You know, those real-time changes and elevations in command, it's a significant obstacle to overcome in difficult circumstances. So keep all those factors in, in the back of your mind as we, we look at the specific actions of the Corps here on July 1st. Uh, they began the day at Emmitsburg, about 11 miles uh, from Gettysburg. And so they're on the move uh, early that morning. Howard's that day were for a quick march. He expressed a desire uh, to keep unnecessary supplies out of the way. He ordered uh, that the troops must be as light as possible so as to be able to move as rapidly as possible when and wherever ordered. Straggling must be entirely prevented. 
that's what Howard's intentions were. And so by the time the, the 11th Corps arrived here at Gettysburg, they'd already covered a significant bit of ground in a much shorter time than usual through an early rainstorm uh, that morning uh, that quickly gave way to a hot and humid July day that you've probably experienced out on the battlefield here at Gettysburg. Uh, it's, it's an uncomfortable uh it's an uncomfortable march, and Carl Schur has noted that by the time the division, by the time his division arrived, they came at a double quick, the weather sultry, and the troops, who had marched several hours without halting a single time, much out of breath. Uh, and so even though they're, they're coming from Emmitsburg, it's also worth, uh, worth noting, I think you can see uh, a little bit of it, it's kind of hard to see uh, exactly on on this map, but uh, Schurz and von Steinwehr's two divisions, uh, they moved via a connecting road from the Emmitsburg Road over to the Tawny Town Road to be able to move more quickly without having to wait for the supplies of the first corps that were also using the Emmitsburg Road. So two of the three 11th Corps divisions are coming into Gettysburg from the Tawny Town Road uh, with Barlow's division. Uh, still coming up the Emmitsburg Road, and they're going to be slowed by the presence of the supplies of the First Corps on the Emmitsburg Road. Uh, but when Schurz arrived, Howard essentially ordered uh, his division, now under the, the command of Alexander Schimmelfenig, and uh, uh, his division and Barlow's division, to support the right of the First Corps. And uh, this is what Schurz wrote in his official report. Howard ordered me to take the third, which was his own division, and the first, Barlow's divisions of the 11th Corps, through the town and to, and to endeavor to gain possession of the eastern prolongation of the ridge then partly held by the first Corps, while you intended uh, to establish the second division and the artillery accepting the batteries attached to the first and third divisions on Cemetery Hill and the eminence east of it as a reserve. So his desire the desire of Oliver Howard is essentially to continue the line of the First Corps uh, on McPherson's and Seminary Ridge onto uh, Oak Hill. There's going to be one problem that you can already see from this map. Uh, the big problem for the 11th Corps, and really for the entire Union Army, is that Oak Hill is already occupied. You can see by the Confederate Division of Roberts Roads. Keep in mind, his division uh, is almost as large as the entire 11th Corps. It's a big division. Um, not quite as large, but it, the numbers uh, are, lar are closer than you might think. Uh, he arrives essentially on the right flank of the 1st Corps, and uh, that's a big problem for the Union Army. It's a different program, but it's a big problem for the Union Army. And uh, Rhodes himself wrote, on arriving on the field, I found that by keeping along the wooded ridge, Oak Hill, on the left side of which the town of Gettysburg is situated, I could strike the force of the enemy with which General Hill's troops were engaged upon the flank, and that besides moving under cover, whenever we could engage him, with the advantage in ground. This position is of necessity going to have to change Howard's orders. They could not be carried out anymore without the 11th Corps moving to attack uh, up Oak Hill. And uh, many years later, Schurz wrote in his autobiography that deployment could not be made as originally designed by simply prolonging the 1st Corps line. For in the meantime, a strong Confederate force had arrived on the battlefield on the right flank of the 1st Corps so as to confront it. The 11th had to deploy under fire at an angle with the first. So they're going to end up deploying, in large part, out here. Uh, Howard did respond uh, by asking Schurz to push forward skirmishers, uh, but the change in the situation, you know, to, to probe, essentially, uh, this position, but the, the change in the situation will leave these soldiers poorly positioned in low ground, uh, really making it difficult to support the flank of the, the First Corps in any significant way and vulnerable on their right to uh, the arriving Confederates from Jubal Early's division that will be arriving down uh, the Harrisburg Road. Uh, but it is worth noting, despite the fact uh, 
that the arrival of the 11th Corps is going to uh, be too late to continue the line here. Uh, their arrival will be a disruption to the Confederates. Uh, Rhodes himself uh, notes about the arrival of the 11th Corps. Before my dispositions were made, the enemy began to show large bodies of men in front of the town, most of which were directed upon the position I held. So just like the, the 11th Corps is going to have to react uh, to the uh, position of these Confederates. They can't not uh, change what they're doing. Uh, Rhodes Division and the Confederate Army, they'll also have to react uh, to the arrival of the 11th Corps. And so uh, I think it's worth noting, among the more significant uh, contributions of the 11th Corps that day is uh, the, the performance of two of their artillery batteries. Uh, Battery I, of the, the 1st Ohio Light Artillery under Captain Hubert Dilger, uh, and the 13th New York Light Artillery under Lieutenant William Wheeler. Uh, they dueled with Confederate artillery uh, on Oak Hill, and uh, the significant elevation of Oak Hill made it a, an excellent artillery uh, platform. It was a threat to the Union lines, as you can see, and uh, uh, Dilger's battery had great initial success at driving off some of the guns before they were opened on, uh, again, from longer range, and then now, uh, with that happening under fire, uh, Dilger responded by requesting a support, which came from Wheeler's battery, who uh, were placed under Dilger's command, and uh, they both performed very well against the Confederate artillery on Oak Hill. And uh, Charles uh, H. Howard, who was Oliver Howard's brother and a member of his uh, staff, said this of Dilger. He said he was not only an accomplished soldier and veteran artillerist, uh, but... Uh, educated as a soldier in Germany, his native country, but was one of the coolest and most clear-headed of battery commanders developed in our Civil War. The Howard brothers don't have a, a ton of praise for the 11th Corps. They don't have a ton of praise for Germans in the 11th Corps. That's pretty high praise uh, for Captain uh, Dilger. Uh, but at this point, with, uh, with the skirmish line moved forward and the artillery... Uh, dueling with Confederate guns on Oak Hill. Uh, the intended deployment of the 11th Corps, even under uh, the, the changed orders, uh, the deployment of the 11th Corps is going to hit a disruption. Uh, and uh, the orders given by Carl Schurz were quite clear uh, for uh, Schimmelfinnig, who you can see his uh, line over here essentially, uh, for him and for uh, Barlow to stay close together to the north of town, uh, with Barlow connecting his left to the right of Schindelfinnig's division. And uh, this planned deployment, uh, as you can see, it would shorten the amount of ground that they had to defend. Uh, there's not a lot of advantages to the position. If there were one possible advantage, it's that they have uh, shorter ground uh, m amount of ground to defend if they stay connected and you, they don't open up these gaps uh, in their lines. Uh, but when uh, Francis Barlow uh, moves forward to the knoll that now bears his name, uh, most commonly called Blocker's Knoll as well, but when he moves forward to, to higher ground, uh, there's, it's going to create uh, some problems and it's going to come as a surprise to Carl Schurz, most importantly, and you know, remember, uh, you know, Barlow's an outsider to the uh, to the Eleventh Corps, and uh, with his youthful appearance, uh, Schurz, I think you can read between the lines some of his opinion of Barlow. Uh, Schurz later recalled his men at first gazed at him, gazed at him, wondering how such a boy could be put at the head of regiments of men, but they soon discovered him to be a strict disciplinarian and one of the coolest and bravest in action. So he has respect for, for Barlow, but he says, goes on to say this, in both respects, he was inclined to carry virtues to excess. At the very time when he moved into Gettysburg, I had to interfere by positive order in favor of the commander of one of his regiments, Leopold von Gilsa, who command of the brigade, whom he had suspended and sent to the rear for a mere unimportant peccadillo. Having been too strict... In this instance, within the next two hours, he made the mistake of being too brave. So 
you can read between the lines and, and see that Schurz has a, a degree of respect for Barlow, but he certainly doesn't think too highly uh, of him. Barlow simply wasn't liked. Like we said earlier about Oliver Howard's relationship to the 11th Corps, uh, Barlow didn't like the 11th Corps, and they didn't like him. He'd write after the battle, I'd take a brigade in another corps over a division in this corps. And uh, Schurz would, would write about Barlow's uh, move forward. He said, I had ordered General Barlow to refuse his right wing, that is to place his right brigade, Colonel Gilses, a little to the rear of his other brigade. But I now noticed that Barlow, be it that he had misunderstood my order or that he was carried away by the ardor of the conflict, had advanced his whole line and lost connection with my third division on his left. Schurz immediately recognized the problem uh, that this created for him. Uh, it not only opened up that gap in the middle of the 11th Corps, but it left Barlow entirely exposed to the threat of Jubal Early's division arriving uh, down the Harrisburg uh, road and uh, you know Barlow's move forward. The impulse to move forward is somewhat understandable if you've stood on that part of the battlefield. The knoll he moved to occupy was higher ground. It was a threat to his line if it was left unoccupied. And in fact, it was already held by Confederate skirmishers that Barlow had to push off uh, to deploy there. And and Barlow, it's worth noting you know, that he's not aware of the exact nature of the threat uh, coming down uh, the old Harrisburg Road. But in evaluating uh, what happens uh, when his division is attacked, it has to be said that any advantage gained by seizing the high ground uh, was so negated by the vulnerability uh, created by disconnecting from Schimmel Schimmelfinick, who was already spread fairly uh, thin, as you can see there, he's essentially got a, a skirmish line out there with von Amsberg's uh, brigade. Schimmelfinnig's already spread pretty thin. Uh, Krasnowski's uh, brigade is held uh, in uh, reserve, and, and Barlow's move forward along with the arrival of uh, Early's division that you can see here. It, it is going to leave him open, leave Barlow open to attack from essentially uh, three sides, uh, with Dole's brigade from Rhodes' division shifting over and hitting him on the left, Gordon's brigade hitting him on, on the center, and the right end of Early's line way overlapped his right. He was vulnerable from three sides. Uh, early later wrote of his arrival, Gordon's brigade was ordered forward to the support of Dole's brigade, which was on Rhodes' left and was being pressed by a considerable portion of the enemy. So Early immediately recognizes that uh, Dole's brigade is moving this way. They're going to move in support. And Gordon described the position of Barlow's division as a strong position on the crest of a hill. So again, it's not an entirely unreasonable move, but he said a strong position on the crest of a hill, a portion of which was woodland. And he continued, my brigade charged moving forward under heavy bank uh, under heavy fire over rail and plank fences and crossing a creek whose banks were so abrupt as to prevent a passage excepting at certain points. This brigade rushed upon the enemy with a resolution and spirit, in my opinion, rarely excelled. And so uh, Gordon's brigade will uh, join the attack head on, uh, crossing over the creek, and uh, despite the, the described strength of the position, uh, Colonel Andrew L. Harris of the 75th Ohio, he noted his, uh, in his report that under attack, both flanks being unsupported and exposed to enfilading fire, were compelled to fall back with heavy loss in killed, wounded, and missing. He recognized the problem about what happened. And uh, Early described it this way. He said, Gordon succeeded in routing the force opposed to him, consisting of a division of the 11th Corps commanded by Brigadier General Barlow. Routing were Early's words. But even with the collapse of Barlow's line, I think it's not really fair to suggest that Barlow's men turned and ran. Uh, this position that you see here, 
you know, was really only established as other units rushed to try to reinforce the vulnerable uh, line at point. But uh, listen to what G.W. Nichols, a soldier in the 61st Georgia of Gordon's Brigade, uh, had to say uh, about uh, that day. He said, we advanced with our accustomed yell, but they stood firm until we got near them. They then began to retreat in fine order, shooting at us as they retreated. They were harder to drive than we had ever known them before. That doesn't suggest that these soldiers out there in a weak position, that they turned and ran at the first sign of trouble. They're overwhelmed by superior numbers. They're hit by two sides, uh, but they... They are not turning and running right away. And uh, the appearance of Early's division should be noted. It's not just trouble for Barlow's division, uh, but it was also a worrying sign to the brigade of uh, Vladimir Krasnowski in Schimmelfinnick's division. Uh, one soldier in the, the 119th New York, he, he recalled this about Early's arrival that day. He said, a long gray line Appeared. It was a beautiful but appalling spectacle, for it rendered our line untenable and defenseless. He was writing with the benefit of hindsight, but his, his words were certainly correct. Uh, but it's, it's worth noting that Krasnowski's brigade, they did what they could to provide a measure of defense for the 11th Corps line. As Barlow's division began to collapse under the, the pressure from the brigades of uh, Doles and, and Gordon that you can see up there, uh, Krasnowski's brigade, which was being held and reserved, uh, was moving forward to their support. They were ordered forward by Schurz after he realized the vulnerabilities of Barlow's forward position. Uh, and even though they didn't arrive in time to dramatically affect the outcome of the fighting on Barlow's no, they did move forward under pressure. And uh, the, the 119th uh, official report recalled, you know, when uh, showing signs of being overwhelmed, we with the rest of the brigade were ordered forward to their support taking position on their left. Here we withstood an enemy more than threefold our number, receiving volleys of musketry in swift succession and suffering severely from a destructive fire of shot and shell. And then again, in the official report of the 75th Pennsylvania, Major uh, August Ledig recalled the whole brigade advanced nearly one half mile, advanced nearly one half mile, which was greatly interrupted by fences, which had to be taken down under a heavy fire of musketry from the enemy. When within 100 yards of them in a wheat field, we charged upon them and drove them back. And uh, as you can see, uh, on the map here, they were able to check, uh, likely, uh, the regiment of the 21st Georgia, who was moving aggressively uh, at that time uh, to threaten the Union line. I should say about the map, uh, you can see it's created by uh, Philip Leno. I'm very grateful I reached out to him uh, to ask if I could use uh, some of his maps. There are not a lot of great maps available uh, for use, and uh, he was kind enough to grant me uh, permission to use his, uh, his maps. Uh, he wanted me to let you know, uh, of course, uh, that his uh, atlas, his campaign atlas, it's published by Gettysburg Publishing. It's available for purchase in the bookstore, and uh, it goes without saying. There is no infallible resource uh, on the Battle of Gettysburg, but if there's an indispensable one for me, uh, it's this book of maps by uh, Philip Leno. Uh, there are few maps uh, that are both uh, as accurate and as detailed. And so I'm very grateful uh, that he granted me permission to, to use, uh, use his maps. And again, I can't commend them uh, highly enough. So I did want to point that out. Uh, but as you can see, you know, Krasnowski's brigade, they're moving forward uh, as the situation is deteriorating on Barlow's Knoll, and they held their ground for as long as they could. Uh, Scott Hartwig, the former historian here, he estimates they engaged uh, doles at, at close range for several minutes, uh, but they were unable to uh, withstand the uh, aggressive response that's going to come when 
uh, Barlow's line began to really crumble uh, on their right. And uh, August Ledig, who we heard from earlier, he recalled during this short period, say 15 minutes, which is not a short amount of time to, to stand your ground in combat, he says, I lost 111 killed and wounded. Uh, but again, you know, what do we want to take about the actions of this brigade? doesn't fit that narrative about the men of the 11th Corps, that they were Howard's cowards or the flying Dutchmen who turned and ran under pressure, under uh, trouble. You know, they moved forward. They stood their ground in, in fierce combat, and the brigade uh, sustained just under 50% of casualties over the course of the battle, most of them uh, probably here on, on July 1st. Uh, they, and they sustained those casualties because they moved forward to check the Confederate attack. One other example of soldiers from the 11th Corps moving forward uh, on that day uh, to counter the threat of the Confederate attack was uh, the soldiers of the 157th New York Regiment under Colonel Philip P. Brown. Uh, they moved forward, as you can see, resolution is harder to see on this one because it's such a big piece of ground, but they're going to be over here. They moved forward to try to flank Dole's brigade. Only one regiment from Schimmelfennig's division really could be, uh, from uh, from that, that part of the line could be spared. And, and in a letter written in August 1863, Brown wrote this. He said, I was ordered by General Schimmelfennig to move over some distance to the right and attack the enemy who were then driving the second brigade of our division. This order I proceeded at once to execute. In order to get my regiment into position to do effective service, I found it necessary to move up to within 50 yards of the enemy, who by the time I reached my position had placed a whole brigade in line to resist my attack. Just one regiment is moving to try to flank Dole's brigade to try to provide some support on that part of the line. And one soldier in the 157th, W.W. W. Boynton, he recalled in his memoir, we moved forward, oblique to the right, passed through and over a rail fence and halted, then received orders to fire. Then came the order to load and fire at will. The noise of the shells and bullets hurtling through the air was terrible. In his history of Company G, another soldier from the 157th, A.R. Barlow, described the fire as murderous while it lasted only about 20 minutes. 20 minutes is still a long time to be out there. He continued, a staff officer finally came riding rapidly toward the field. He reached the line of fire and his horse fell. It was Captain Clinker of Schimmel's staff. Clinker dismounted, waved his hand to Colonel Brown, then unfastened his saddle and with it started for the rear. Colonel Brown ordered a retreat, the scattered remnant of his regiment, their organization broken, a sorry sight, left the field. These soldiers didn't turn and run. They fought, they stood their ground. And many were, were captured because of it. Boynton recalled of his own capture. He said, I found myself near a fence over which rushed the Confederates and ordered me to surrender. I dropped my gun at once and stood facing the gray boys at attention. And in a letter to his parents from the battlefield, more soberly, on July 1st, Lieutenant Frank E. Gates wrote, I am wounded and a prisoner. But don't worry about me, for I think I shall live. I shall suffer much, but I shall be glad to bear it for the sake of our cause. Our regiment, 157th, suffered severely, but the boys stood remarkably well. Again, these are not the words of soldiers who turned and ran, but soldiers who moved forward, who stood their ground and willingly risked life and limb fighting for their cause and country. Even after parts of the line began to break, soldiers from the 11th Corps moved forward under fire to try to check the Confederate advance. But the Confederates, uh, they couldn't be checked, and, and eventually, as you can see, the entire 11th Corps line uh, gave way uh, during the retreat of the 11th Corps through town, uh, which was uh, quite 
chaotic. Adelbert Ames described it as uh, the, the Corps is falling back with little or no regularity, regimental organizations having been destroyed. Uh, you know, there was one final unit of the 11th Corps that engaged in significant combat on the afternoon of July 1st, and that's the brigade of Colonel Charles R. Coster. They moved forward too. Uh, by the way, the description of Ames that, you know, the retreat being chaotic, that's not to say that the chaos and disorder was due entirely to the fact that these soldiers were cowards who at that point decided to just turn and run. There's plenty of evidence that... Uh, that with you know, no command structure to, to guide them, individual soldiers and groups of soldiers uh, provided some resistance, throwing up barricades and fighting in, in the town. So that even that uh, comment is not you know, inclined to dis necessarily disparage uh, the soldiers of the 11th Corps. It simply ex uh, explains the fact that the command structure uh, broke down in a very chaotic situation. But back to, to Coster's brigade that you can see here, you know, during the fighting, uh, Schurz was very concerned about uh, the vulnerability of his right flank, rightly concerned. He had requested an additional uh, brigade from von Steinwehr's division that was being held on Cemetery Hill, and he wanted that to shore up uh, that side of his line. Uh, but by the time they finally were ordered forward, as you can see, the 11th Corps line is essentially giving way, and uh, Schurz had, uh, he wrote this, uh, about that moment. He said, had the brigade of the 2nd Div Division been then at the appointed place when he wanted them, I would have ordered it to charge upon the flanking enemy. So he wanted to try to use them uh, a little bit more aggressively even, taking them in flank and rear, but that brigade not being there, all I could do was to endeavor to rally the 2nd Brigade, which was Ames Brigade of the 1st Division, Barlow's Division. The enemy, however, pressing on with great vigor, that uh, brigade could be rallied only in part. Uh, and so Schurz is recognizing the fact that he, he really would have liked to have Coster's brigade uh, earlier. Uh, but Coster's men, when they did finally go forward, they were positioned uh, north, the railroad station, uh, to the east slightly of Stratton Street, uh, as the situation was getting uh, quite bad. And uh, von Steinwehr... Uh, who was uh, the division commander, he recalled in his official report that Coster was ordered by Schurz to check the advance of the enemy who were pressing toward Gettysburg and before whose overwhelming numbers the 1st and 3rd Divisions were forced to fall back. He simply described it this way, Colonel Coster had a severe engagement with the enemy but was, of course, not strong enough to restore the battle. By the time they were ordered forward, the situation is clear. There. They are buying time, trying to, to slow down uh, this significant threat uh, over here. A severe engagement, to quote von Steinwehr. That might even be a bit of an understatement. They simply could not withstand uh, the pressure that they're facing at the moment. But they did buy valuable time for the, retreat, uh, for the rest of the retreating 11th Corps. They suffered uh, a high number uh, of casualties. Uh, but... Uh, they did uh, slow down the Confederate advance, check it to some measure. And uh, Scott Hartwig concludes uh, this. He said, the defeat of the 11th Corps marked the end uh, of, uh, of organized resistance by the 11th Corps. I think uh, I meant to, to write the defeat of Coster's Brigade. Oliver Howard recalled at 4.30 the columns reached Cemetery Hill, the enemy pressing hard. The soldiers of the 11th Corps were rallied there. Uh, and they were reformed uh, to, to wait, uh, await an attack. And they awaited an attack that, that never came, uh, likely in strong part uh, due to the position of the Union artillery, the reserve that Howard had held there. They managed to keep Cemetery Hill out of the hands of the Confederate Army. Debates about what happened uh, after that point, that's, that's another program, but... By the, the time the 11th Corps uh, is driven back to Cemetery Hill, uh, they've managed to slow the Confederate uh, momentum. The Confederate Army that had made the attack on that position, is uh, the, the organizational structure is, has been disrupted by their movement at that point. It, it's not as simple as simply pressing on to Cemetery Hill. But again, the debate about uh, whether an attack that didn't come should have come, that's a different uh, program, uh, but you can see that the 11th Corps did contribute uh, to 
uh, the, ar the position of the Army of the Potomac here on July 1st. So as we conclude, uh, let me suggest just a few ways to change the narrative about the 11th Corps here at Gettysburg. We've covered a lot of ground quickly, and I tried to do it by letting them speak in their own words. That's one of the advantages of programs uh, like this. There's a more opportunity to let these soldiers speak in their own words where we can point to places on, on, on a map. Uh, but you know, first and, and most basically as we seek to change the narrative, we need to resist the temptation to play armchair general when we talk about Gettysburg and other Civil War uh, battles. Nobody likes a backseat driver. And uh, you know, we should not offer our opinions without experience. Most of us, most of us are not trained military professionals. We have no experience leading soldiers in the combat. And uh, it goes without saying that none of us uh, commanded troops here at the Battle of Gettysburg. It's easy for us uh, to pretend like we know what we're talking about. Uh, it's easy to say, you know, to fall into the trap of thinking we've read enough books. Uh, we've studied enough details, we've walked the ground uh, enough to know what should have been done with the benefit of hindsight. Uh, but these generals, and these, these officers, these soldiers, they were not fighting with the benefit of hindsight. They had to deal with real problems in real time, and even when real mistakes were made, uh, they were often making the decisions that they believed were the best ones. So even in my criticisms of uh, some of the leadership of the 11th Corps, like Oliver Howard at Chancellorsville or, or Francis Barlow here, I, I try to stick to criticisms, and I hope you picked up on this, that, that were or could have been lodged by their contemporaries who were arriving at different conclusions at the same time with the same information available. A lot of the bashing of the 11th Corps could be avoided uh, if we resisted the urge to opine uh, about what should have been done or explain why we think events here happened the way that they did. Uh, so we should, uh, we should resist first the temptation to play armchair general. Second, we need to recognize the impossible position of the 11th Corps. They're on bad ground. They're on bad ground. They're in a, a bad position. In many ways, you could argue the story is really already written by the time the Confederates occupy Oak Hill. The 11th Corps is on low ground against an enemy, moving on them from multiple directions. Now there's a significant gap between them and the 1st Corps. And like I said earlier, the question from the beginning, it's not whether the 11th Corps will withdraw, but when and how. And given the fact that, uh, given the fact that the Confederates control Oak Hill, uh, we're a long way to explaining what happens to the 11th Corps here, uh, even before uh, we consider uh, the threat from Jubal Early's division. So uh, you know we have to recognize uh, the fact that the 11th Corps is really asked to do the impossible here. They're asked to defend bad grounds against. Uh, Confederates and larger numbers of Confederates arriving from uh, different uh, from different parts of the battlefield. And then third, we should reevaluate uh, the combat narrative of the 11th Corps, like we we just did. Don't settle for an overly simplistic narrative that the Germans ran. Recognize that that overly simplistic narratives never ever tell the whole story. Uh, remember that when things got bad on Barlow's Knoll, Krasnowski's brigade moved forward. Remember Colonel Philip Brown in the 157th New York moving forward to harass Dole's flank as, as trouble uh, developed and sustaining uh, there the, the highest number of casualties of any regiment in the 11th Corps. Remember Coster's brigade. And of course, remember the individual soldiers uh, on the line. When you want to criticize the, the 11th Corps, uh, when you want to dismiss them as the flying Dutchmen, remember that these are American soldiers fighting for their country. 
Soldiers like Frank Gates, who was able to write when he was wounded, I shall suffer much, but I shall be glad to bear it for the sake of our cause. These are soldiers who suffered, who experienced pain here, who experienced trauma here. Like the anonymous line officer who later wrote of his experience, while I was engaged, a stalwart young fellow dropped at my side and cried, oh, help me. Having taken my hand, he struggled to rise but could not, and finding his efforts of unavailing, murmured, Oh, I'm gone. Just leave me here. And then this writer continued, A moment or two later, I too felt the sting of a bullet and fell benumbed with pain. It was an instantaneous metamorphosis from strength and vigor to utter helplessness. Remember soldiers like them, and remember American soldiers like Private Otto Moritz Engel, who was an immigrant from Germany, killed here at Gettysburg, who wrote home to his family at the beginning of the war, I have always had a presentiment for human feelings, and I have always had a presentiment for human freedom. And this human freedom is now at stake in the present struggle. And he continued, it is safe to assume that the North, with a good and just cause on its side and with its endless means, will be victorious in this struggle. Then, as in one voice, we can shout, Long live liberty. Remember soldiers like him. Thank you very much for attending today's winter lecture. I'll stick around and answer uh, any questions uh, you might have, but I hope you enjoy the rest of your time here at Gettysburg National Military Park.